And I'm not gonna lie, there, there was definitely a lot of t tuning down the voices in my head, not looking at the red flags because it was so shiny and new and exciting. You know, I'm human, I'm obviously gonna, you know, go down the, the rabbit hole. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that's probably why it only lasted a month. And if that's okay, I'd like to move on to some questions from the audience. Um, so sure. please raise your membership card or your hand if you have any questions for Julia. Um, let's go to the member on the first row. Do we have a mic? Hi, um, I just wanted to ask what film, music and art from your um, uh, childhood and past do you think influenced you most as a person, as an artist, uh, so on and so forth? Thank you. Um, I actually lived above a video store growing up, so I was in there all the time and I would go through phases where I would watch the same movie every day for like a year. And um, The Virgin Suicides was one that I had a, a very long and sick obsession with. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was another. Um, I really like, um, Char it's Charlie Kaufman, right? Charlie Kaufman, yeah. I really like Adaptation. And, and for music, I actually used to like go to sleep listening to K-Rock, which is this um, like American or New York um, rock station. So I would be listening to Sublime and Rage Against the Machine, um, even Nickelback sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> just like I, I used to listen to like a lot of rock growing up. Yeah. Based on what you told us tonight, do you think sex should be viewed purely as a commodity or do you think there's something sacred about it still? Uh, I wish I could say that because it should be sacred. Um, and I think that if women were given more equal opportunity in the world, then they wouldn't be forced to commodify it, you know? Um, but it's the, the world we live in, so if that's what you have to do, then there's no shame in what you have to do to survive. But obviously it would be nice if it could be sacred. But I don't know, I don't even know if men view it as sacred though, so probably not. <laughs> oh, no. um, and let's go to the member in the red jumper. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, Uncut Gems is one of my favorite films, so I was just yeah. curious if you could give us like a story from filming that you just remember. Um, oh my gosh, we had so much fun filming that. It was really like just kind of making a movie with your friends, and at the time I didn't realize how big of a movie it was gonna be. It was just like a fun little thing. Um, but some of my, my most fun experiences would probably be like smoking blunts with Kevin Garnett in between scenes and then showing up stoned, like red, red eyes and the makeup person running after me with eye drops and then I couldn't remember the lines and I'd like freeze once they said action. Um, but it was fine because we were all friends and, and we all kind of knew that we were part of something really special. We just didn't know what, um, but it was a really, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the member at the front here. Thank you. Um, really, you know, I've been listening to what you've said so far. I just wanted to ask, um, do you really believe that a world in which porn consumption and kink is more normalized is truly a world free of the male gaze rather than making mainstream some of the more violent and cruel tendencies of male sexuality. Thank you. Wait, can you repeat it? Because it was super, yeah. like, grainy. Sorry. I'll no, it's the mic, it's, it's not on. you. I wanted to ask if you believe that a world in which porn consumption and kink is more normalized is truly a world free of the male gaze and stigma, rather than being a world in which you make mainstream some of the more violent and cruel tendencies of male sexuality. Well, I mean, hmm. 
I think that if something is normalized, then there's less shame about it, and therefore, I think it it will in in turn make men less violent about it. Do you know what I mean? Because right now it has to be done in like secrecy, and then they have all this shame, and then that shame turns into anger, which then gets projected onto women. So I think if if it's just more normalized. And then women can also express it as well, or be more open about what they're into as well. Because I feel like women just sometimes go along with whatever their partner want, and like don't really even ever have a chance to explore their own sexuality because they're so busy just aiming to please. Um, that would be really great too, but I don't, I don't know if I see that happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't mean to push back hard on you or anything, but um, you talk about pornography as being a space for both women and men to explore their sexualities, but would you not, are you not of the belief that currently as it stands, pornography and the sex industry overwhelmingly is there to fuel male sexual fantasies rather than female sexual fantasies? Absolutely. And I think that, I don't, I don't want to talk down on pornography because I understand that that is how a lot of women make a living and it's unfortunate that they are, I don't want to say unfortunate, but it's, it's unfortunate that, that that's where they've had to go to survive. Um, but I don't want to shame them because they've had no choice a lot of the time. But I do think that it is very damaging and it's damaging to both women who are having sex in the real world and, you know, look like regular girls, you know, don't have the boob job. Now, I feel like a lot of women, even in the mainstream media, are starting to resemble these porn star-like figures because they're kind of being pushed there subconsciously by their male counterparts because that's, what's, that's what gets them off. I actually saw a post, it was like maybe on Twitter or something, and it was like, like after my wife had a baby, her stretch marks gave me the ick, and I, I had to like break up with her. And it's just so crazy because it's like it's stretch marks. Everybody has them. Like what the hell? But you know they're so used to seeing these perfectly airbrushed babes, and they are losing the gauge on what real women look like. Like even after the Barbie movie came out, there was this whole debate about whether Margot Robbie was mid. And it's like, are you joking? She's so stunning. But again, they're looking at women that look like a very unattainable standard. So they're setting a very unattainable standard. So I, I do think it's damaging. But the root of it is something so much bigger than just pornography. Like pornography is a symptom of something much bigger and deeper that's wrong with our society. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the member on the front row. Hi, thank you for being here. You look absolutely incredible, by the way. Definition of iconic. Um, if there was one thing that you could say to your younger self, like when you read us that part of the book and you said you were sort of around our age, if there was one thing that you could say to your younger self either to reassure or inform, like what, what would you say? Uh, I would just honestly tell myself, like, don't, like, don't worry so much, you know, because I feel like I spent so much time worrying, or I was either worrying about the future or dwelling on the past, and I could never really just be in the present. I would always try to escape the present through drugs. Um, so I would just tell myself, like, don't worry so much. Have, have more faith, because a lot of the time in life you just kind of end up exactly where you're supposed to be and you kind of need to just have blind faith like even growing up i had like the lowest self-esteem like i did not think i would ever go anywhere and people would always say like you should be an actress you'd be such a great actress like you look like an actress or people would say you should write a book like like your stories are so great and i'd always be like yeah right you know but then there was that little voice in the back of my head that was like well maybe you know because they would plant that idea and then i could see myself like as that being a possibility so i don't know maybe our futures are already 
set for us and we have to just have faith that we'll get there and not worry so much about the big things. Like I always used to be like, well, once I have this uh, car, I'll be happy. Or once, and it's like, no, life, happiness is not the big things. It's all the little tiny things that stack up. And and it's just about making the right decision at, at the, the moment and doing the right thing and being a good person. Like karma is super real. Um, and, and that's really like what I would tell myself to just have a little bit more faith and not worry so much. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the member at the back, the very back. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. I think I speak for everyone when I say, you know, slay, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, woo! Anyways, um, my question is, this book is very empowering. Obviously, it aims to destigmatize um, this um, sexual fantasies. So what are the next steps for the Miss Julia Fox? So what are we looking forward to in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, I don't want to be put, I don't want to label, I don't want to be put in a box. Like, I'm not just an actress. I'm not just a writer. I'm not, you know, there's, I think there's going to be a lot of different things that are going to be super random, but I just love doing a bunch of different things. Like, even in, in my past, I've been a photographer, I've had art shows, I've had a fashion line, I've had, you know, I've, I've always done a lot of different, I've had a lot of different interests, so I'm, I'm just probably going to continue to, who knows, I might come out with a mixtape, you might hear me on a rap song soon, <laughs> anything's possible, baby, um, but yeah. I hate to ask about the certain rapper, but I know we've been kind of talking about feminism and sexuality and I was wondering if it was at all conflicting for you or it was hard to navigate dating someone who is pretty ex has had some explicitly misogynistic scandals and has a pretty misogynistic reputation in the music industry um, and how you handled that with um, your kind of message in, in general that's pretty feminist. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There, there was definitely a lot of t tuning down the voices in my head, not looking at the red flags because it was so shiny and new and exciting. You know, I'm human. I'm obviously going to, you know, go down the, the rabbit hole. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that's probably why it only lasted a month, because I was, you know, <laughs> after, after the, the newness. <laughs> as soon as it got old and it wasn't fun anymore, I, I just check, checked out, you know? And also, I'm like a mom. Like, I, I couldn't, I think that he really needed someone to be his mom. <laughs> and I already am, I already have a baby and I don't want to. <laughs> So that was definitely a part of it, yeah. Um, let's take two more questions. So let's go to the number right next to you there. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, so many fem female celebrities are slut shamed and pigeonholed by the media. Um, and you've overcome these things and only become much stronger and a much more amazing businesswoman. Um, so what is your advice to women that are trying to break this mold, especially as many of the women in this room will only be branded as professional rather than dynamic beings? It's a good question. I definitely struggle with that a lot. Um, I think the, the, even as cliche as it is, just keep showing up and keep being your authentic self. Like, don't let anyone dim your light. Like, I think a lot of the time as women, when you're shining too bright, someone tells you to sit the fuck down and we're like, oh my God, sorry, you know, like, sorry, sorry, sorry. And it's like, no, we just have to be unapologetic and we have to keep showing up and being our most authentic selves and just, we cannot let them tell us to get in line and stay in our place because I think right now women are killing it in like every single field. We are outnumbering, outpacing men in schools, in the work workforce, in 
pop culture. This is really our time. And so obviously I think that's why there has been such an uprising of men on podcasts spewing misogynistic crap. But I see it as just a very like pathetic cry. You know, I think they're just, they just can't stand to see us win. And that's why we have to keep winning. And let's go to the member there on uh, fifth row. Hi, I just wanted to know how it felt to like to revisit really like challenging times in your life, specifically your experiences with addiction. Oh, it was really rough. <laughs> I, well, like there were so many times that I was like, I'm just gonna call a ghostwriter. I'm just gonna call, you know, I'm done, I'm done. And then I would just tell myself, just finish this chapter and then we'll call the ghostwriter. And then I would finish the chapter and then by the, before I knew it, I was done with the whole book. So. It was definitely really challenging. I felt like I did it with like one eye closed, like looking at the computer like that. Like I couldn't, it was so cringe. But overall, I think it's like important, you know, and it's truthful. And I think so many times when you're a public figure, you're kind of told to scrub away at, any, and scrub at anything, any stain on your past. And I just think that perpetuates um, very impossible standard because we're all human. We all know somebody or have struggled with something, whether it's depression or addiction or whatever it is. So I think we need more people to be honest and upfront about it. And then also, if you do that, no one can use it against you. There's been so many times when my past was weaponized against me, so I kind of really had to take charge of the narrative and like own it. And, and then in doing so, I kind of disarmed them and, and what can they, you know, what are you gonna do now? Like, so I just think own your past, never be ashamed of it. And if anything, you'll be able to attract people that are like you. If you're always wearing a mask in life, you're never gonna f find your people. So, yeah. Um, thank you. And one question that we ask all of our guests, if you could leave our members with something to think about for this week, what would it be? Um, Hmm, I guess, I guess just think about, or meditate rather, or manifest um, your, your wildest dreams and think about what, what's the craziest thing that you could see happening, you know, whether it's gonna go, you know, be a lawyer for the United Nations and help underprivileged people around the world or be um, the next prime minister or whatever. I, I mean, you guys are like all clearly very, very intelligent people to be here. So I feel like the, the world is yours, guys. And do not, to put, don't place any limits on yourself because you guys can really, you guys got this far and just getting here alone is a freaking miracle. So you guys should all be really, really proud of yourselves because I'm super proud of you guys. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming. If you could please stay seated um, while we leave the chamber. Um, Judy will also be doing some more book signing in the Goodman Library, so if you would like to do that, you can make your way there after we leave. Um, but thank you, thank very you much guys. For